Good morning, everybody. Good morning, ladies that are here, and good morning to those who are on Zoom. Welcome here. I'm so glad to be here, and I'm so glad I'm not alone here, that we're together and we can gather and be in God's Word. And I'm thankful that I'm not alone in sharing this text with you, that the Holy Spirit is, is among us, is in us, and He can help us in understanding. So um, I'm going to star- start our talk in Numbers 31, um, talking about bears. So um, we have a picture of bears up there. Mother bears are affectionate, um, protective, devoted, strict, sensitive, attentive with their young. And not unlike people, bears can be empathetic, they can be fearful, joyful, playful, and social. So with a show of hands, do I have any mama bears in the room? (laughs) So what happens when someone messes with your young? I know that I'm a protective mama bear with, um, with my kids, with my husband, with my friends and family. If anyone messes with the people that I love, um, emotionally, physically, I'm not okay with that. Our eldest daughter, we call her mom number two uh, in our household. Um, her younger sister is only two years younger and 10 days, but um, she's very protective. And just the other day, um, our youngest daughter got hit in a competitive ice hockey game. And she got up in the middle of the rink and she just stormed out and started crying and went to the the room outside of the rink because she could not handle seeing her sister go through that hit and and not be able to do anything about it. I'm like, don't go over to the player's bench. Don't go to the coaches. Like I'm saying, stay away. Um, Well, Mama Bear has two primary instincts, nurturing and protecting. And bears are not considered malicious or mean. They're very gentle and tolerant animals, but just don't mess with their, mama, their cubs, right? So I found this picture kind of funny. <laughs> Says, I'll eat your face if you mess with my cubs, you know? But such a nice face there, right? <laughs> um, but the photo beside it gives a, or another photo gives a better visual of protection, and that's that, just that stance. Um, as we see in Numbers, God is super loving and protective of his people. He heard his people's cries, in Egypt, and he delivered them from slavery, right? You remember that? Seems like so long ago, right? And then he brought them to Mount Sinai, and there he gave them his covenant and his promises to them. And even though God despised the rebellion, he made a way to be in their presence in the Holy Tabernacle to be with them. And after that one-year stay in Mount Sinai, then they were to set off and go to the promised land, right, that he had promised them. And he promised Abraham. The Lord commanded census, laws around how they arranged around the tabernacle, moral laws, purity laws, and then they set out to travel, and the complaining starts, we remember that, right? All that complaining, even with the brother and the sister. And then in the wilderness of Paran, they're halfway to the promised land, and what do they do is God commands them to send out those scouts, remember? And 10 scouts say, nope, we can't take this land, and two say yes. And God got angry, but Moses interceded, right? but not in place of his justice, of God's justice. And so the Israelites were sentenced to 40 years until they died. And um, during that time of wandering, even the Levites rebelled. Even Moses rebels when he dishonors God and puts himself in God's place. So even Moses had the same fate of not entering the promised land. But don't worry, we know that there's another leader coming up, and that's Joshua, to enter the promised land. Now, during this time, they're camped outside um, on the plains of Moab, and we learn about King Moab and him seeking out Balaam, and we had a lot of, uh, a lot of lessons on that, and how he wanted to curse the Israelites. But God was protecting the Israelites even when they didn't know it, and, um, and Balaam could only bless them three times, and he even showed him a vision of the, of the future king, King Jesus. Wouldn't you know that Balaam comes in our text today? <laughs> So have you made your decision about if you think Balaam is a good guy or not? I hope you have. The whole story until now shows God's judgment and his mercy. So we are in this part of the story now where the next generation is wanting to go into the promised land. There's another census. There's some more instructions to pass on to the people. And then here we are at Numbers 31. God is in protective mode for his people, and he wants to lead them in his ways. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about leave vengeance to a holy God who shows the way to obey. And we're going to do that in four points. The first one's going to be longer. The the last three will be shorter. The Lord's vengeance, not ours. Purification required. Give to the Lord. 
and thank God. So let's start with the first one, the Lord's vengeance, not ours. So since I know you've had an opportunity to read through the text, to discuss it in your people, in your groups, um, I know that I can come to you now and say, this is a very difficult text. We have a God, our God, who is asking his people to lead them into this war, a holy war, where they're going to destroy everyone, including women and children. And that's not an easy thing to wrap our head around. It's just not. Um, so I want to acknowledge that. I, wa I want you to know it's okay if you wrestle with this. Um, just don't sit in that wrestle. With all that we've learned through the text and through the gospel connections, let's summarize a few facts so we get our head in the right place before we read this text again together. So the first one is that God calls his people to be holy as he is holy. God cares a lot for his people, and he, he actually hates death, right? He hates it. Remember what God's character has been throughout this narrative until now. Kind of a little bit of what I just summarized now in the book of Numbers. Remember, God's judging sin, and he doesn't delight in the death of the wicked. Actually, like, God sent his son for the wicked, you and me, right? To save us, and, and that's love. And Christ will return when? In 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but, in, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any of you should perish, but that all should re reach repentance. A Catholic priest once told me in my journey of faith that it's okay to question your faith, and I'm going to ad lib and say and understand who God is, as long as it leads to investigation. So how do we investigate tough texts like this? By reading God's word and understanding in the context of what it was written. That's the first part. And through God's word and reading it from beginning to end, we learn about God's character and who he really is. By, and we can learn by asking God to reveal the truth to us, like to pray to him and to ask him, you know, God, this is a tough one for me. Can you explain this to me? And um, Leslie, who taught the lesson on Monday night, she actually uh, shared this book with me uh, from Dr. Paul Copen called Is God a Moral Monster? And so if any of you are, are still struggling after this time, which is, which is okay, like maybe that's a book for you to read. But if you're stuck, I recommend, I recommend any or all of the things I just suggested because we need help to guide us through these things. So anyways, let's go into the text and read it in the context of what is happening. So in Numbers 31, 1 to 6, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Avenge the people of Israel on the Midianites. Afterwards, you shall be gathered to your people. So let's remember who are the Midianites. If you remember back in Exodus 2, um, Moses had gone and he fled and went to Midian. And there he got married, so his wife was Midian and his father-in-law was too. And the Midianites, they were a nomadic people, which means they were people that wandered all around. So actually, Midian lay in the south of Canaan, but large bands of Midianites, they would just travel and go to different areas to find places for their animals to graze. And so that's what we find here, is the Midianites are here next to the Israelites who are near the Promised Land. So whose war was it? How can we tell? We just look at the scriptures, and we'll continue on verses 3, where it says, So Moses spoke to the people, saying, Arm men from among you for the war, that they may go against Midian to execute the Lord's vengeance on Midian. You shall send a thousand from each of the tribes of Israel to the war. So there were provided, out of the thousand of Israel, a thousand from each tribe, 12,000 armed for war. And Moses sent them to war, a thousand from each tribe, together with Phanemus, the son of Elzar, and the vessels of the sanctuary, and the trumpets for the alarm in his hand. So whose war was it? It was definitely God's war. In verse 3, it says, The Lord's vengeance on Midian. And he only took 12,000 people to war, 1,000 from each tribe, so they were represented. So I'm a numbers person. So even though it doesn't say how many people, how many Midianites there actually were, what we do know is that they took 32,000 young girls, so they were not married in age. So that can only give you an assumption of how large this army must have been for the Midianites. So they didn't win because of their quality of their weapons or their superior force they, or their strategy. 
The Israelites won because God was with them and gave them the victory. And so when it speaks of our text about Lauren's vengeance, I know that that word vengeance, it's, it's a strong word. And the definition of vengeance is punishment inflicted or retribution exacted for an injury or wrong. So what led to this moment of wanting to avenge the people of, Israelites, of the Israelites by sending them to war against the Midianites? What, what led to this? Well, if we remember back in Numbers 25, 1 to 3, it said, while Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. The wrong was that the Midianites were responsible for enticing the Israelites into Baal worship. God calls his people to be holy. There were consequences to this. God's judgment, and there were two parts. Actually, the first judgment was on his own people, God's own people. In Numbers 25, 45, we hear that they say to hang all the chiefs of the people. The judges were to kill all the men who yoked themselves with Baal and Peor. And then later, in the plague, 24,000 people were killed. And the second judgment is now with the Midianites, the Lord's vengeance on Midian. So that was the complete destruction. So again, why this judgment? Well, God made it very clear at Mount Sinai and with his first commandment, you should have no other gods before me. God gave many warnings to his people about this, and God gave his promise that he would be their God and their only God. We are talking about a holy God, and sin deserves death. And we've seen God's judgment, and we've seen his mercy and faithfulness to the Israelites throughout this entire journey in the promised land. Now, being parented, because we're all here, and being parents, we know a lot about judgment and mercy, right? Um, we want to teach our kids to do good things, and um, we try to tell them and parent them, and we set rules out for them. You know, don't touch the stove, be careful how you walk across the street, be careful when you're driving. Um, we don't want them to get hurt, right, our kids. And then there's also, like, emotional and moral things. We want them to be kind and tell the truth and, and do your homework and all those kind of things. And if they don't, there are consequences. I don't know, does anyone remember that series, Super Nanny? Um, it kind of dates me a little bit, but we used the naughty mat when our girls were young, and it worked beautifully. I loved it. Um, but, you know, you might say no dessert for your consequences, or you'll say that they can't, um, they can't go out with their friends, or they get their car taken away. And it's hard to punish them. It's so hard as a parent. And sometimes we show a little bit of mercy, right? Like, we're like, okay, you can have a little dessert, you know, because you, don't, you really don't want them to suffer. Um, but when the situation is so serious, you stand firm and you carry out judgment because you want them to understand the gravity of their choice. The most serious, dangerous, and problem for Moses and later Joshua in leading these people, the Israelites, was not the armies that they were going to face. It's actually going to be the, the ever-present temptation that the Israelites were going to have with the pagan Canaanite religions and their customs. That was going to be their biggest temptation. In Numbers 31, 14 to 18, it says, Moses was angry with the officers and the armies because they let the women live. So why did Israel take the women captive instead of killing them, as they were commanded to do? They probably kept them because of the tempting enticement of that Midian lifestyle. They, their desire for fun and pleasure caused them to loosen their spiritual commitments. It just shows us that if we discover sin in our lives, we need to deal with it completely. So if you get, like, don't you get disciplined at work if you show up late or if you don't do your work or you don't have those right social skills? Or um, didn't you get disciplined as a kid or you discipline your kids now if they have poor actions, poor words or whatever? So why wouldn't we discipline ourselves too? about the sin that sometimes we carry. Um, have you ever relaxed in your moral standards in order to justify your desires? Are you being influenced to grumble, gossip, drink more wine than usual, watch shows that aren't really edifying, focus on the next purchase, skip church or time with God at home, or in just general hang out with people who are maybe not the best influence on you? In Hebrews 12, 1, it says, Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And how do we do this? By fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, 
scorning at shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you won't become weary and, grow and, and lose heart. Jesus had opposition, all right. So I encourage you not to lose heart, to make those corrections along your journey of faith, and to keep going. We see in our text, it's also um, very serious when we're tempting others. If you are tempting others, God will hold you accountable. So be aware of that. But, but for the tempted, there is hope, as we are not alone in our temptation. I mean, Jesus himself was tempted 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. And so he's able to help us with temptation. In Hebrews 2.18, it says, it says, He himself, who has gone through suffering and temptation, he is able to help us when we are, we are being tempted. He is faithful to help us. And in Psalms 119, 9, and 11, and 1 Corinthians 10, 13, those are two other passages confirming God's help with us. So we work through why God's vengeance and the judgment on tempties now, but let's look at leaving the vengeance to God. In Romans 12, 19, it says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for as written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. The Israelites not only saw God's vengeance, and what I mean by that is God's judgment on them, but they actually got to see it on their enemies. We don't get to see that, do we? <laughs> you know, when there is injustice sometimes, um, we can respond like in Revelation 6.10. And they cried out with a voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? You know, our hope, I, I hope it's our hope, our hope is that those who have done wrong will come to Jesus. Right? But for those who don't, even though we don't see the wrath yet, it is coming. Revelations 11, 17 to 18 says, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. In the time of dead, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. So if God is doing the avenging, what is our part in this world? Matthew 5, 38, 42 says this, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. It's so wrong, it's so hard when you've been wronged just to leave it, isn't it? But God is not asking us just to leave it. He's asking us to leave it with him, to not retaliate and to, to show love. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we're called to respond differently. In John 13, 34, 35, it says, now, for now I'm giving you a new commandment. Just as I have loved you, you should love others. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So remember, the Lord's vengeance, not ours. Um, two, purification required. Purification was required if you killed someone or touched a dead body. Do you remember back when the statue of the law of the Lord was commanded, was introduced? It was back in Numbers 19, uh, 11 to 13, and it says, whoever touches the dead body of any person shall be unclean seven days. He shall cleanse himself with the water on the third day and on the seventh day, and so be clean. But if he does not cleanse himself on the third day and on the seventh day, he will not become clean. Whoever touches a dead person in the body of anyone who has died and does not cleanse himself defiles the tabernacle of the Lord. And that person shall be cut off from Israel because the water for the impurity was not thrown on him. He shall be unclean. His uncleanliness is still on him." So basically, when a person touched a dead body, he was considered unclean, unable to approach God in worship. The ritual performed or purified the unclean person so that once again he could offer sacrifices and worship God and live in the camp among God. Death was the strongest, was, I say was, the strongest defilement because it was the final result of sin. Thus, a special sacrifice, a red heifer, was required, and its ashes were to purify water symbolically for ceremonial cleaning. So who did this apply to? 
And in Numbers 19, 10b, it says, and this shall be a perpetual statue for the people of Israel and for the stranger who sojourns among them. So it was, it was for everybody. So now we actually see this purification process put into practice in Numbers 31, 19, where it says, encamp outside the camp seven days, whoever of you who has killed any persons and whoever has touched any slain. Purify yourself and your captives on the third day and on the seventh day. So besides the people, the plunder that they collected from the Midianites also required purification, not only as being tainted with death, but also because it was possessions of such evil people. So in addition to the general law was added. So in Numbers 31, 20 to 23, it says, you shall purify every garment, every article of skin, all work of goat's hair, and every article of wood. Then Elzar the priest said to the men in the army who had gone to battle, this is the statue of the law that the Lord has commanded Moses. Only the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, and the tin, and the lead, everything that can withstand the fire, you shall pass through fire, and it shall be clean. Nevertheless, it shall be purified with the water for impurity, and whatever cannot stand the fire, you shall pass through the water. So why the purification of a fire? Because water cannot cleanse metal, while fire can. So when I think of being purified, I think of like, you know, when you're dirty or you're taking your makeup off, like you just want to be clean, right? Totally clean. And on the weekend, we went away for a night, and we went into this hotel room, and they had a beautiful soaker tub. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to go get one of those bath bombs. So I went shopping, and I found one that even said purify. I thought, oh, i got to use this in my sermon here. Um, I put that bomb in the, in the tub, and then I don't know if it's just me, but I always, when I start putting the water in, it's always too hot. Like, don't you ever find it when you get into the tub? You're like, ah, scorching. So not only did I purify myself with a purifying bomb, but I scorched myself with the, the heat from the, the water. Um, but think about it this way, like, um, I have two, uh, cutting boards at home, one for vegetables and one for, uh, raw meat. And the reason for that is that that raw meat, the juice, it goes all over the cutting board. And when you're cutting with a knife, it's all there. And then it goes on the countertop and then you're taking your cloth or your favorite towel and you're trying to wipe that up. It just goes everywhere. And even though we all have sinks and hot water and we can just wash that cutting board, for me personally, I put it in the dishwasher. I want it to be purified. I don't want to, all that juice to come off because it just, yeah, I want to go on that high temperature and just take care of it. Well, sin is like that. Everything that it touches, it defiles. So God is so holy, and we are so not, and so God made this way for sinful, disobedient people to, to be in, in communion with him, and that was through rituals and killing of animals for sacrifice, to make atonement for their sin and uncleanliness. Thankfully, God sent Jesus to be the true lamb, the true sacrifice, for once, one time. So whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life because of his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. As we study the scriptures and we talk about this purification process, doesn't it blow your mind what Jesus came to do? Like, this is like the weight of the sin on him and one-time sacrifice. So thankful for that. So in God's eyes, you're all, all of you who are believers are righteous. To those who haven't made a commitment to God through belief in Jesus Christ, can you imagine all your wrongdoings from the past, the present, the future, all of them being erased because one man, the Son of God, chose to die on your behalf? Talk about a burden lifted. <laughs> Forget about living in this life like it's your last, right? But realizing that the living will really begin when we're in heaven and when paradise with God. But there's a warning to all of us, believers and unbelievers. God is faithful to his promises and to his covenant, but he will let people walk in rebellion and face their consequences. So it's our choice to obey or not. Sin is so serious. Um, our daughter Jessica was away at the grad camp out, a uh, youth retreat this last weekend, and I asked her, what was the one thing that stood out to you? And she said, the gravity of our sin. She says, we don't grieve our sin. Wow. <laughs> yeah, we just say sorry and we just keep on going, right? We just don't realize that gravity. So how can we do right when we sin now? Well, we confess our sins to a holy God. If we've wronged someone, 
We need to apologize to that person, but we also need to apologize to God. In 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from every wrong. That's reassuring. And I also love what it says in 1 John 3, 1 to 5, it says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children. I love it. We say beloved. And that, and what we will be has not yet appeared but we know that when he appears we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness sin is lawlessness you know what you know that he appeared in order to take away sins and in him there was no sin so purification is required Hope in him purifies us. Okay, point three, give to the Lord, or the levy for the Lord, or your Lord's tribute. Um, in Numbers 31, 25, 31, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Take the count of the plunder that was taken, both of man and of beast, you and Eleazar, the priest, and the heads of the father's house of the congregation, and divide the plunder into two parts between the warriors who went out to battle and all the congregation. And levy for the Lord a tribute for the men of war who went out to battle. One out of 500 of the people and of the oxen out of the donkey and the flocks. Take it from their half and give it to Eleazar the priest and as a contribution to the Lord. And for the people of Israel, half you shall take one drawn out of every 50 of the people of the oxen, of the donkeys and the flocks, of the cattle, and give them to the Levites who keep guard over the tabernacle of the Lord. And Moses and Eleazar and the priest, the priest did as the Lord commanded Moses. So we see here that there's two aspects to the Lord's command. One is to divide the plunder, and the other is to give a specific portion, percentage to the Lord. Um, I'm a numbers person. My husband's an accountant. I'm a bookkeeper. So I was calculating the Israelites' portion already on my page, and then I flipped over, and I saw the chart, and I got so excited. I couldn't wait to fill that in. <laughs> so, um, right? Any of you else feel, felt that way, too? I'm not alone, yes. Um, in Numbers 18, it talks more about that just as the Levites received a tithe of the Israelites' goods, they in turn were required to give a tithe of the tithe, right? Tithe of the tithe to the priests as their own harvest offering. The food was compensation for the tabernacle service. The food tithes had a sacred origin as holy gifts to the people of Israel, and they were not to turn these gifts into something common by neglecting to give to the, to the tithe into the priests. So what does it say? That no one was exempt from giving a portion to God. So even the Levites who were ministers had to tithe and to support the Lord's work. Even though the Levites had no land, they had no businesses to generate income, they were to treat their income as someone, as the same as everyone else, and to give a portion. So similarly, the money that we earn is not ours. It's not our own. Everything we possess, indirectly or directly, comes from the Lord, and it belongs to Him. And God teaches us, His followers, to supply the material needs of those who devote themselves to meeting the spiritual needs of the community of faith. That's the people who are at our church, who work at our church. And also to share a portion with those in need. So, um, being an accountant and bookkeeper, we taught our girls at a very young age that um, we want to teach them that how everything that God gives us is, is God's. And so we encourage our girls when they were really little, I would probably say make five or six, to go collect pop cans and take them to a recycling depot. And they come back with their, their change. And we taught them that you give 10% to God, 10% to savings, and you got to keep 80%. Well, they thought that was awesome. Wow, is God generous, right? And we made fun giving. So after many, many months, they would maybe accumulate a loonie or a toonie. Um, we'd divide that up into quarters, and they would get to decide who they gave it to. And literally, they would like tape it with some tape on a, onto a piece of paper. They'd write a note, and we would take it around town to all the different places, and they would give their tithes. Now, when they got a little bit older, we actually got them to do bookkeeping. And I think they said that they're the only teenagers that had to do bookkeeping. But we taught them because we wanted them to see it and to, to write it out and to be intentional about this before it was like piggy banks, right? 
And at 15 years old, we encouraged them to go get jobs because my husband and I did. And, um, and at that point, they, we said, okay, no more bookkeeping. Um, you have a bank account. You can just transfer your funds, which is really easy. And so they have a bank account. They have their main uh, bank account. They have their donations account. It says donations on it. They have um, a savings account. And then I actually have an extra one for car insurance because it's big and they have to save up for that. Um, so now they just transfer. And do you know how easy it is for them to transfer that money? Because they had that principle set when they were making very little pennies, and now they're making hundreds and thousands, to know that that wasn't their money to begin with. And then they take out of their donations and they decide, decide who they give to. And sometimes it's just their monthly contributions that they, they hand out, but then there's leftover, and I'll say, girls, that amount's accumulating, you have to decide where you're going to put it. And now our oldest daughter, she's heading off into university, and she's going to be gone for three years, or... or have, well, she's still going to be home. She's not going to be gone. What am I thinking? <laughs> she's going to be home. But anyways, um, there's going to be a budget. And, and so I kind of slid that budget to her. And it included the ties, just because she's going to school. Um, yeah, so it's important to be intentional with God's money. Um, I know even for my husband's business, when I look at it and I give thanks to God, I always thank God for my husband's business. And then I thank God that my husband works hard at his business. But I always am thankful that it's God who gave it to us, right? Um, so decide. You have to decide how much you want to share. Um, in Proverbs 3, verse 9, 10, it said, Honor, the wealth, honor your wealth with the best parts of everything your land produces. Then he will fill your barns with grain, and your vats will overflow with the finest wine. This verse isn't promoting prosperity gospel, but rather it's saying, Honor God, and he will take care of you. And it says, Give him the best parts. Giving is so easy now. Like, you can actually do it with debit and visa, and you can do it automatically. So, like, it can come out of your bank account before you even earn the money, which is really great because then you really have to trust God that he's going to, you know, provide for you. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7, it says, Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each make up your own mind as to how much to give. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pleasure. To pressure, not pleasure, pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. It's so great to give, and we have a community care offering once a month. We have missionaries that, that need our support, and there's so many fantastic local and global um, charities that we can support. It's great to give, and often our giving reflects our relationship with God and how thankful we are for what God has given us. So just keep that in mind. Seek God and ask him to direct you about how much you should give, and I hope that he helps you to give generously. So give to the Lord. Fourth and our last point is thank God. Not only did God give his people victory over the Midianites, but we see in verses 48 and 49 that after careful accounting, counting, for all their men, the officers discovered that not one soldier was lost in battle. Like, wow, this is incredible. Can you imagine all the wars that we have been alive for if we would hear a news broadcast saying, no soldiers died? Like, it would be crazy. It would be, it'd be amazing. What was the officer's response to that protection? Well, we see in verses 50 that he says, And we have brought the Lord's offering, what each man found, articles of gold, armlets, and bracelets, signet rings, earrings, and beads, to make atonement for themselves before the Lord. The commanders gladly offered these gold objects in gratitude for such a great victory and protection that resulted in no loss of life. This was a voluntary donation. This was not something that was expected of them. Um, so they were quick to thank God for protection over them. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, it says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So God wants us to give thanks. Do you ever wonder what God has protected you from? When you look back at your life, can you see what and whom God has protected you from? I can. When you're going through difficulties and feels protection, do you thank God? In Psalm 91 is a psalm proclaiming God as our shelter and our refuge. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. 
He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. God as protector will carry us through all the dangers and fears of life. Trusting in him, those, trusting in him though, means trading your fears for trust in him. So are you up for the challenge to fully trust in him? To do that, it, it means to do what it says in verse 1, to dwell, live, rest in him, trust in him. By entrusting ourselves to his protection and pledging our daily devotion to him, we will be kept safe. It says in verse 5, continuing, You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. So the godly should not be afraid because the Lord watches over them. Now, this does not mean that we won't have difficulties. It will just mean that God's goodness will be there with us. Um, after um, a sermon or after studying festivals, I'm not sure which it was, I can't remember, I, just start, I decided to do a chart. It was called the Date of Remembrance of God's Goodness. And um, I just have a chart here, and I, I just think of the ways that God has protected me. And I started, and I still have to fill in some dates, and I can still add to it. But like I just think here of my cancer journey that, I, I was, that God survived me through and protected me through, or the birth of my premature baby in hospital in June in 2002. And there's so many other ways that, that God has provided and, and protected me. And so I encourage you to maybe put together a list or put together something that you can refer to so when you're going through difficult times or even when you're in good times that you can look to this list and remember God's protection over you. Continuing on in verse 14, it says, Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. He calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. So let's love the Lord, know his name, call out to him, and he will protect us. Let's be quick to thank God for delivering us and protecting us. Thank God. So in closing, as we come to Bible study, community group, church every week, let us not just know the rules that God has set before us, but let's actually obey them, living them out by following God's lead and trusting in his protection, just like the cubs in this picture, falling behind their mama bear. You know, to those of you who have made a decision for Jesus yet, know that he's knocking at the doors of your heart. You just need to ask for forgiveness for your wrongs, believe in him, and receive him. Let him in. It's, it's your choice and yours alone. So let's remember, leave vengeance to a holy God who shows the way to obey. The Lord's vengeance, not ours. Purification required. Give to the Lord and thank God. Let, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you and we thank you that you are a holy God. And we thank you that the standards that you have for us is for us to be holy too. But Lord, we can't do that on our own. We desperately need you. And Lord, we're so grateful for your word that shows us the way. You don't ask something of us and then not show us. And, and so we're thankful for your faithfulness. You're, we're thankful for your protection. We're thankful, Lord, that we don't have to be vengeful. That we can just turn another cheek and just continue to show love. And, you know, even when that's hard, Lord, we know that you will show us a way to do that. And that we can just leave the vengeance to you. Lord, thank you that you teach us how to give to you properly. And, Lord, help us to realize that what we have, all of it is yours. That we wouldn't have anything if it wasn't for you. We wouldn't even have the breath that we breathe. And, Lord, thank you that you purify us through our belief in Jesus Christ. Thank you for his uh, sacrifice and his work on the cross. Thank you that you, you believe us when we confess our sins to you and, and that you take away all those wrongdoings and that we're righteous in your eyes and we have a future hope in eternity with you. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this gift of your son. We thank you for your protection and we thank you for your word even when it's hard to read and understand. 
Give us your understanding, Lord, we pray. And thank you for each and every one of these ladies, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.